Uh, hello everyone. Uh, today we are continuing on the mechanical properties of materials and basically we will be covering uh, modulus of elasticity or sometimes called as Young's modulus uh, which is a characteristic uh, material property of elastic materials. Uh, in our last video we have seen the tensile testing uh, of a material and uh, for certain ideal uh, materials, if you were to uh, pull this material uh, in one axis, and if you were to uh, measure the displacements uh, corresponding and the corresponding strains, uh, you can uh, see several ideal uh, material behavior. And we have seen linear elastic material behavior in that sense, uh, rigid plastic material, and also uh, elastoplastic material. But what we have not mentioned in that uh, slide is uh, the slope uh, for the linear uh, elastic case uh, or the uh, elastoplastic case. What does uh, these uh, slope slopes mean to us? So. For elastic materials, uh, let's go over that example again. If we have a material and we are testing it in uniaxial tension, so the state of stress is uh, uniaxial tensile uh, stresses. Uh, and if we were to plot the stress strain diagram uh, for a linear elastic material, we will see such uh, a straight line. And this slope which is the, the uh, stress sigma divided by strain epsilon uh, will give us the E, we will label it as, and it's called the modulus of elasticity or the Young's modulus. So the slope of this stress strain curve uh, is related to the interatomic force separation curves that we have covered in the first weeks, first few weeks of this uh, course. If you remember, as you pull, these bonds, atoms, ions, or whatever they are, uh, will be separated uh, from them. And if you were to plot that interatomic force between atoms or ions versus the separation curve, you can have such behavior for a strongly bonded case or a weakly bonded case. So. Uh, the slope of this curve at the equilibrium point, as you see over here, is related to the uh, modulus of elasticity. So for a strongly bonded material, we may have like epsilon 1, or I'm sorry, E1. Uh, for a weakly bonded case, we may have E2. And in this case, E1 will be much greater than E2. In other words, it will be difficult for the atoms of the strongly bonded case to separate when you compare it to the weakly bonded case. So displacements or strains will be uh, lower for E1 and strains will be higher for E2. And uh, again, uh, we have seen this in the elastic and plastic deformations. Elastic deformations uh, is uh, reversible. Uh, therefore, whenever uh, you remove the loads, or sometimes we call it constraints, uh, whenever those are removed, the body returns to its original configuration. So it re regains its shape uh, and size. And uh, elastic behavior of uh, metals and ceramics is usually linear at low strain. So such a behavior is seen in metals and ceramics and for low strains. Moreover, uh, in this class at least, in this class, the deformations are small assumption is valid most of the time. So keep this in mind. If we were to look at the modulus of elasticity of uh, various materials, uh, it is uh, high in covalent compounds uh, such as diamond. Uh, it is lower in metallic or uh, ionic crystals. 
and it's the lowest in uh, molecular amorphous solids such as uh, plastics and rubber. Over here uh, you see various materials uh, and their modulus of elasticity as you can see it ranges from 0.01 gigapascals in other words 10 megapascals to up to like 1000 gigapascals and our civil engineering materials like concrete uh, lies over here so it can it is sort of can be counted in the porous ceramics uh, family of uh, materials and its modulus of elasticity can range from 10 gigapascals uh, to like 40 gigapascals and another material civil engineering material that we use uh, is steel of course uh, it is uh, it has a modulus of elasticity of about 210 gigapascals and another example from uh, a polymer PVC uh, window frames that uh, PVC is often used in uh, window frames it can it can have a modulus of elasticity of like 3 gigapascals so the uh, unit of modulus of elasticity is often expressed as a stress unit but most of the time we put like giga so 10 to the power 9 over there uh, emphasizing that it's a big number and uh, so elastic deformations are observed only for small strains in typical structural materials here, here you see uh, a sintered alumina which is a family of a brittle ceramic and the modulus of elasticity of that material is like 325 gigapascals. But if you were to look at a ductile metal, uh, see initially it has a, a linear elastic case and uh, we will have uh, a modulus of elasticity of still, let's say, 210 gigapascals. Uh, as we have seen uh, in plastic deformations, once you reach a certain limit, uh, the deformations are no longer uh, elastic, but it will be uh, plastic. Uh, for uh, ductile polymers, uh, we can observe large elastic strains, and they can be completely reversible. But again, initial elastic modulus is uh, sort of linear, you can uh, consider them. And it is rather low, as in the case of uh, PVC. Uh, and let's say for the same stress, let's say 30 megapascals, you have a steel, let's say over here, and 30 megapascal is where? 300, so some, somewhere over here. Uh, what's the strain? You go from here and you will read a value of 0 0.00014. So 30 divided by this number. But if you were to look at a ductile polymer, so 50 megapascal is over here, so like 30 is somewhere over here. If you come from 30 and you will read a value of 0.001, so it's 70 times higher. What do these mean? What do these strains mean? If you remember our lecture uh, relating strains and deformations, now if you consider uh, a test material that has 100 millimeters in length, so we are stretching a 100 millimeter uh, length rod uh, with 30 megapascal stress, then the amount of deformation for this specimen will be 100 times the strain value 100 times this value will give us 0.014 millimeter and for pvc again 100 times this will give us 0.1 millimeter as you can see steel which has a higher elastic modulus when compared to pvc will deform much less when you compare with pvc uh, this plot shows us again various uh, engineering materials. Uh, x axis is the density of that material, and y axis is the modulus of elasticity uh, of that material. Uh, well, well, let's focus on our materials, civil engineering materials. Like concrete is somewhere over here, 
and uh, still is somewhere over here as you can see and still typical concrete will have let's say 30 gigapascals and its density will be about 2400 kilograms uh, per cubic meter versus steel if you were to read it from here it will have a density of that much 7800 kilograms per cubic meter versus it will have a elasticity modulus of like 210 gigapascals uh, in the here, uh, again, you can uh, look at polymers. They have much lower Young's modulus, and their density is, of course, much lower than both steel and concrete. One more point that I want to make over here is wood. As you can see, uh, it says wood parallel to grains or wood perpendicular to grains. They have, they may have even though they have the same density, because we are testing the same wood, well, they have quite different Young's models. And what this means, we will explain in a little bit. And whatever the material is, as you can see, the uh, modulus of elasticity is closely related to the density uh, of the uh, material. Another uh, parameter that affects uh, modulus of elasticity is the temperature. Here you see the modulus of elasticity of various uh, metals, and when they are subjected to extreme temperatures, like say this is room temperature, as the temperature increases, as you can see, all of these metals lose their modulus of elasticity. It could be drastic, for certain materials like steel, see from 210, in the case of a fire, like 500 degrees Celsius, its modulus of elasticity will uh, come down all the way to below hundreds, meaning that they will lose their capacity to uh, resist stresses. Now, the term isotropy and anisotropy. We have to uh, further explain this uh, for our uh, future uh, uh, description of mechanical properties. Well, the physical properties of some crystals uh, depend on the crystallographic direction in which the measurements are taken. Uh, and for example, the elastic modulus or modulus of elasticity the electrical conductivity, index of refraction of certain materials may have different values if you are testing it in these two directions, let's say 1, 0, 0 direction and 1, 1, 1 direction. So this directionality of properties is termed as anisotropy and it is associated with the variance of atomic or ionic spacing uh, with crystallographic direction. And substances in which those measured properties are independent of the direction of measurement are called isotropic materials. So isotropic materials, if you were to test it in this direction, in that direction, or in any other direction, all the properties will be the same. So it will not depend on the uh, direction of the measure. Over here, uh, I am showing the modulus of elasticity values of several metals like aluminum, copper, iron, tungsten, and they are being tested in 100, 110, and 111 directions in terms of modulus of elasticity. As you can see, tungsten has the same modulus of elasticity Therefore, it is termed as an isotropic material. When you look at copper or, or iron, as you can see, they have quite different modulus of elasticity. Therefore, they can be considered as anisotropic materials. But if you were to look at aluminum, as you can see, these numbers are quite similar. So I would like to call this as a near isotropic material. But these measurements, I have to mention that they are being tested at the micro level. So in the grain 
boundaries, within the same grain boundaries, they are being tested. And we have seen, we have seen that polycrystalline metals may have various uh, grain boundaries, and because of the random nature of those grain orientations, most polycrystalline metals are known as isotropic. So in the micro level, even though iron is anisotropic, in the macro level, it is an isotropic material. Now, in order to explain this isotropy and anisotropy in terms of mechanical properties, let's consider a cubic specimen. Let's say that this. So it has a length of L0 in all three directions. And we are loading it as shown over here, upside down. And as we compress this material, it will be compressed along the load. And the amount of deformation that we observe, this is a cross-sectional view of this three-dimensional uh, view, uh, delta 1 will be final length LF minus L0. Now, let's consider the same cube. Now, this time, we are loading it in a different way. So the same cube, not this way, but we are loading it that way. So this way. And again, if we were to look at how much it deformed along the load, okay, along the load, longitudinal deformations I'm talking about, LF minus L0, so delta 2, we will get. So if this delta 1 equals delta 2, we can call this an isotropic material. But if it's different, then it can be called as an anisotropic material. Well, it's difficult to mention it's an isotropic material by just looking at only two directions. If you were to lo load it in the other direction, for a complete isotropic material, it should have, again, the same deformation. So isotropic materials have the same mechanical properties in all possible directions. And anisotropic materials show different mechanical behavior in different directions. Now, now, let's look at the loading of a metal in two directions. So the same cube, we are loading it that way. Remember, this is a metal, and we are loading it this way. Longitudinally that way, and longitudinally this way. So delta 1 and delta 2 we are measuring. If delta 1 and delta 2 is equal, and that's the case for... Uh, polycrystalline metals, as I said. So, when mechanical properties are considered, most polycrystalline metals are known as isotropic materials. How about an anisotropic material? Well, the uh, example that we give the most is the wood. So, let's consider the loading of a wood in two different directions. But before we go further, let's remember what wood is like. So this is a tree that we obtain the wood from this trunk. So this is a, a, a wood log. And as you can see, there is these annual rings each year uh, as the tree grows, they form. So these fibers, these fibers become important in wood. So... If we are loading this wood perpendicular to the fibers or parallel to the fibers, we will get different behaviors. To explain that, let's turn this wood 90 degrees for both cases. So we are loading the wood perpendicular to the fibers. So these are the fibers and we are loading it perpendicular to the fibers versus load is parallel to the fibers. I'm sorry, okay, let's go back here. So these are the fibers, see? And the load is 
perpendicular to these fibers. And we measure uh, the formation of LF minus L0. Now let's come back to parallel to the fibers. So the same cube. Now we are applying the load that way. See the load is now parallel to these fibers. So this is the loading axis and this is the fiber. So they are parallel. So now see I draw them differently. Delta 2 if you were to compare it with delta 1 they are different and in this case the fibers are stronger and they do not deform much and that's why we will have a delta 1 which is greater than delta 2 and that tells us that wood is an anisotropic material and if you were to look at the whole picture for wood let's say if we were to obtain stress strain diagrams when we load it parallel to the fibers versus stress strain diagram when the load is perpendicular to the fibers as you can see we will obtain two different slopes over here the first slope for the same stress will be for much less so we'll have a higher modulus of elasticity and for the same stress when we load it perpendicular to the fibers the strain will be higher therefore the modulus of elasticity will be less so that concludes us about isotropy and anisotropy uh, in our next video we will be looking at, at the elastic constants uh, for uh, isotropic and anisotropic materials <laughs>